You can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you for having me today and I will jump right into my talk. The previous talk was a perfect uh, stepping stone for my talk today. I'm talking about AI in agriculture, exploring the promises and perils of an AI-enabled green transformation in the Philippines. So um, shaping the green, green transition with AI. First of all, the question is, how can we shape the green transition? Um, it was already pointed out a few um, possibilities today. Uh, so AI offers a versatile toolkit for amplifying the green transition among diverse economic actors. It was said, like, with increasing amount and complexity of unique data available, decision-making can no longer keep up with the trend. And as a result, there is a pressure to use algorithmic technology to automate and expand data-driven analytics. This can then support environmental, environmental administration in decision-making, management, and monitoring of environmental policies. Um, AI is also said to play a key role in the transformation from a linear to a circular economy, Again, this is due to the capability of AI of efficient data analysis. For example, past data and real-time data can predict demand, thereby minimizing waste. Um, then carbon neutrality can be achieved in the energy sector, in the transport sector. And today we will focus on the agricultural sector. By utilizing the potential of AI in the agricultural sector, transformative changes can be introduced that reduce the industry's carbon footprint, promote sustainable practices, and improve overall environmental protection. Um, so to see the role of the agricultural sector um, in the green transition in general, uh, we will first look at the agricultural sector in the Philippines specifically. Um, so let's first look into the domestic agricultural economy. The Philippines is an agricultural country where about a quarter of the population, that is 24%, is working in the sector and agricultural land accounts for about 42% of the total land area. Um, in 2021, the most produced crop was sugarcane uh, with a total production of 26 million metric tons, followed by palai rice coconut production and banana and on the world market the philippines is both the second leading exporter of pineapples and the second leading exporter of coconut um, producing 23 percent of all coconuts in the world um, however recent challenges have impacted the philippines agricultural landscape largely due to production losses from monsoon rains and the typhoon duxuri and also el nino um, as a result, there was an inflation, and in August, food prices increased by 8.1%, with rice and vegetables as the main drivers. So the international prices were further pushed from the export ban recently imposed by major rice exporters, such as, uh, such as India and Myanmar. And then high inflation, leading to higher food prices, can make it difficult for farmers to compete in the global market, uh, and further... Significant food price inflation impacts food affordability and thereby particularly impacts low-income households. Uh, given that these effects of climate change and climate-related disruptions are expected to be felt even more in the coming years, a resilient agri-food system adapted to climate change is needed to ensure food security. Um, so what is the impact of climate change on agriculture exactly? Let's look at it in a bit more detail. With raising temperatures and the ongoing effects of climate change, there is an incre increasing prevalence of typhoons, intensification of monsoons and droughts. Hence, climate change alters the severity of dry and wet seasons. During the dry season, there is a notable decline in the number of wet days and total precipitation, accompanied by an increasing increase in the maximum duration of dry spells. This can be uh, attained through more irrigation if that is affordable and available. Conversely, during the rainy season, there is significant increase in maximum five-day precipitation and reduction in the maximum duration of dry spells. And excessive rainfalls, especially towards the end of the crop cycle, can result in severe damage to the crop yield. Um, so both excessive and insufficient rainfall can result in severe damage to the crop, crop yield and then raising food prices and pushing inflation. And given these factors, one can see that the agricultural sector in the Philippines is highly sensitive to climate conditions and the effect of climate change. Um, and it is also disrupting the planting calendar, um, changing crop quality and food security. So 
also vice versa, the agriculture sector is also a driver of climate change. I apologize already in advance. This is going to be a very intensive slide with a lot of numbers, but bear with me. Um, agriculture as a sector is responsible for non-CO2 as well as for CO2 emissions caused by the conversion of natural ecosystems, most forest land and natural peatlands to agricultural land use. In 2018, global emissions due to agriculture were 9.3 9 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. And put differently, the agri-food system from farm to fork uh, accounts for 21 to 37 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. According to the Asian Development Bank, the agricultural sector in the Asia and Pacific region plays a significant role in contributing to climate change as it is responsible for the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions associated with agriculture. This is partly to the fact that the region has globally the largest agricultural production share with a large area under rice cultivation and increased livestock production. Especially rice is problematic. The region accounts for about 90% of global rice production. However, methane emissions from global rice cultivation account for almost 50% of all crop-related greenhouse gas emissions and 10% of cropland nitrous oxide emissions. So putting that again on a global scale, rice makes up to 12% of total methane emissions. Uh, and methane is part of the greenhouse gas emissions, so it translates to 1.5% of total global greenhouse gas emissions only from rice production, which is a, an incredible high amount. Um, so the reason um, that the emissions from rice are production are increasing as well is the response to ensuring food security for the growing population worldwide. And there has been a substantial increase in the utilization of synthetic fertilizer and energy for agricultural production in recent decades. So consequently, there has been a substantial surge in emissions of nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide from agricultural activities. And looking at the agricultural sector of the Philippines specifically, emissions from rice cultivation account for 62%, which then translate into 33.8 megaton CO2 equivalent of the national agricultural emissions. So it's in line with the global estimates of rice as a driver in agricultural pollution. And now looking at digital agriculture, we will look at its potentials to support decarbonizing the agricultural sector, as well as making the sector more resilient towards climate change. And then later I'll look at some limitations and risks that are associated with increasing use of digital agriculture. So first of all, the um, potentials. The director of the Bureau of Plant Industries, Gerald Glenn Panganiban, is advocating for the strengthening of digital agriculture in the Philippines to further develop the sector. Digital agriculture can be defined as the use of digital technologies to make farm operations more insightful and efficient. Much of this transformation is made possible through the adoption of automated techniques, including AI, the Internet of Things, IoT, and the gathering and analysis of agricultural data via wireless sensor networks, weather stations, monitoring cameras, drones, and so on. Um, so digital agriculture can enhance resource management and optimize production. Uh, one example is image collection via drones. Uh, the picture taken by the drone can give information on status of soil based on which fertilizer and irrigation recommendations can be made. Um, this can then reduce unnecessary fertilizer use up to 80% and also expenditure on pesticides and herbicides up to 90%. To give a more concrete example, the implementation of the AI system called Xavio in digital farming solutions led to 30% 30 reduction in fungicide applications in a European context, thereby mitigating environmental pollution. And in Brazil, the implementation of Xavio resulted in an average 61% reduction in weed spraying, effectively reducing herbicide and water consumption by almost two thirds. This system and other similar smart farming tools incorporate extensively annotated data points encompassing various factors such as weather conditions, light, seasonal variations, and wheat distribution. And then leveraging this data, the system can, for example, calculate the precise amount of fungicide or herbicide needed in the given context. Um, in the Philippines, uh, here, one example is from the 
Phil Rice LCC app developed by the Department of Agriculture Philippine Rice Research Institute. The app can assess the nitrogen status of the rice plant. Nitrogen fertilizer has to be applied several times during the growing season to ensure that the crop's nitrogen need is supplied, particularly at critical growth stages. And the app generates fertilizer recommendations uh, based on a digital image taken from the field, allowing farmers to fertilize rice plantation fields more efficiently and avoid pest infestations as a result of over-fertilization. So it can already help with reducing the um, too high load of agrochemicals on the fields and also help reduce expenditure on fertilizers. So these are all very great potentials that the digital agriculture um, has, but um, it, it Despite all the opportunities it offers, it also faces several risks and limitations. I will first present country-specific risks related to socio-demographic and economic factors tailored to the Philippines, and then general risks that all countries and governments equally need to be aware of in an, an AI-enabled green transformation. So first of all, one limitation of the green transformation in the Philippines is that ICT, Information and Communication Technologies, Literacy is presumed, that was also mentioned in the previous talk. Um, however, depending on formal level of education and age, one should be careful making this a, a presumption. Rice farming communities in the Philippines are aging with the average age of Filipino farmer ranging from 55 to 59 years and continuing to grow older. Based on this statistic, one could raise the possibility that while the world advances to digital farming solutions, the digital divide will widen. And to overcome this, it is necessary to find ways to make digital agriculture inclusive to all age groups. Um, and an important side note is that high access to ICT does not necessarily equate to high usage. Um, in addition, AI application in the agricultural sector mainly focuses on intensive and industrialized farming systems, and initial investments can be very expensive. Yet the average size of a farm in the Philippines is mostly small-scale family farms with 1.29 hectares, and 38% are even under half a hectare. So hand-in-hand hand with that concern is that ICT should serve farmers of all income levels and sizes, However, due to large upfront costs, the acquisition of advanced and modern farm tools and equivalent equipment uh, remains a privilege. So another limitation of AI in agriculture is that current developments focus on widely grown crops, for example, wheat, maize and rice in industrialized agricultural areas and climate conditions. Hence, widespread, widespread application in other climatic environments may lead to unsustainable into intensification of irrigation or fertilization, perpetuating the current blind spot of Western technologies about different food cultures and food systems. Um, so the previous mentioned ambition of the World Bank of climate relevant data sets is also very, very relevant here. Um, Europe has different weather um, and raining patterns in Southeast Asia and specifically also the Philippines. In the Philippines, seasonality is very strong and the type of extreme weather events and the country experiences is very unique to its context, making its climatology very dissimilar from that of many of the northern Western countries where AI technologies are developed or trained. So the use of foreign technology in a context here should be evaluated with scrutiny and regional oversight to um, gain all the potentials that it can offer. And yeah, the climate conditions would be then, uh, as I said, the Pacific Typhoon Belt, the possibility of flash floods, droughts, and um, yeah. Then going on, moving on to the systemic uh, system specific risks, the potential of AI to support a green transformation requires strong AI governance to overcome the challenges and risks while ensuring that sustainable and ethical norms are not compromised. Generally, defining ethical principles for AI is the subject of very extensive debate, which also falls beyond the scope of this presentation. For this presentation, the ethical principles under considerations are fairness, transparency, accountability, privacy, and robustness. Um, starting with fairness, 
Um, fairness entails adopting an inclusive approach to guarantee that the advantage offered by technologies are open and attainable for everyone with due consideration for the unique requirements of various age groups, cultural backgrounds, uh, individuals with disabilities, women, and so on. An unfair situation that may emerge from the use of AI systems in the farming context is building AI tools that favor organizations and actors in power or create power imbalance due to access and control of farm data. The transparency um, principle is relating to interpretable AI, refers to the extent to which humans can comprehend the outcomes generated by AI algorithms. The lack of understandability of certain types of AI models undermine the transparency principle. For example, to decrease the impact of greenhouse gas emissions, AI tools can be used for the assessment and management of carbon dioxide in production facilities. Farmers should be able to challenge the given assessment of their carbon footprint in case they believe the decision was unjust or inaccurate. The accountability principle, the problem with AI models in most automated decision-making system is the lack of clarity on who or which organization will be held accountable for any errors or wrong recommendations made by the system. For example, if an AI system sprays substantial amounts of water or pesticides on the crops due to errors in the system, who will be responsible for the loss of harvest? Um, then privacy. Privacy is a fundamental right for safeguarding human dignity, autonomy, and agency that should be respected, protected, and promoted at every stage of the system's development. And the primary privacy-related concern in farming concept uh, encompasses a lack of control over data as well as issue about the types of data collected. The misuse of farm data becomes a significant concern when it is shared with out the farmer's consent or when the data is processed or used for purposes beyond the initially stated intent. There we go again into the problem of power imbalance. And finally, robustness. Challenges related to the robustness of AI technologies can impact the reliability and performance of the system. Uh, from a hardware perspective, it requires farm equipment to work properly and reliably. For example, in a large-scale livestock industry, milking dairy cows is performed every day by automatic equipment. In the event of an abrupt technological malfunction, manually milking hundreds of cattle becomes unfeasible, and such failures pose a risk to the animal's welfare and cause financial harm to the farmers. And then, again, it goes back to who is accountable for this, and also there should be security checks that the system is not encountering these errors and malfunctions, so it must be robust. So um, what can be, or what are policy recommendations that can be derived from these country-specific and system-specific risks? Uh, policymakers play a key role in supporting research and development for ethical and responsible AI and innovation for digital agriculture. In May 2022, the Secretary of Ag Agriculture, William Didar, inaugurated the Precision and Digital Agricultural Center, PREDIC at Central Luzon State University, to introduce the latest precision and digital agriculture technologies and adapt them to the Philippine context, thus further enhancing agricultural production in the country. This raises for me the question of whether it is the responsibility of the PREDICT Center and the Department of Agriculture to ensure and enforce ethical and responsible innovation in digital agriculture, because only by doing so they can achieve their goal. They quote, helping the lives of the community and everyone in the community. So lastly, um, it is important to identify and assess the vulnerabilities in domestic social ecological systems that can increase the accuracy level and success of adopting AI systems. For example, in many cases, farmers are not comfortable working with new technologies because of the tool's complexity or farmers' unfamiliar unfamiliarity with the technology. Um, hence, the governance should provide training sessions for farm workers to help them gain the right skills. Uh, farmers should also be invited to take part in user studies and usability testing the technology, and that can ensure the usefulness and hence user friendliness of the tool. Another possibility would be brochures and guidelines in a very straightforward and understandable way. So it's very inclusive for all kinds of um, uh, farmer situations, and farmers are encouraged to use the resources and the technologies. Then finally, equity and inclusivity, so that nurture the development of digital ecosystems for AI technologies, 
with small scale farming in mind. Um, yeah, so all in all, we can see that digital transformation in the agricultural sector has a lot of potential, but uh, must be implemented with care and awareness to the regional context to really leverage all the potentials that this digital transformation can have. Um, yeah, and that was my take on this. <laughs> Thank you very much 